Exchange traded funds or ETFs were launched in India towards the end of 2001 and remained rather non-existent for over a decade. It was in fact the government's efforts that gave ETFs a fresh lease of life, firstly with its recognition as an asset class in 2013, then the government's disinvestment initiative in 2014 through ETFs, and most importantly, the Employee Provident Fund organization's decision to invest 5% of the incremental monthly inflows into ETFs. This gave a big boost to the structure and from an insignificant 12,000 crores in FY 2015, this instrument now has an AUM of over 4 lakh crores. So in this video, we shall examine ETFs in greater details. What is an ETF? How does it work? How it compares with index funds and stocks? Its benefits and drawbacks, the different types of ETFs, the expenses, taxation and a lot more. Let's begin. An ETF is a tradable security that tracks either an index, a commodity, bonds, or any basket of assets. There are two important phrases to focus on here. The word tradable means an ETF works a lot like a stock, which means it can be bought and sold on a stock exchange during trading hours. Consequently, the ETF's trading value depends on the NAV of the underlying asset that it represents. And speaking of asset, this brings us to the second phrase of our definition, which says that an ETF tracks either an index, a commodity, bonds, or any basket of securities. In that context, a good representative sample of an index will be the Nifty 50 index whose value is what a Nifty 50 ETF would track and replicate. Likewise, the ever popular gold ETF would be a worthy example of an ETF that tracks the commodity whose trading value is tightly aligned to the domestic price of the gold. Now, specific to how ETFs are constructed, these are formed via a creation redemption mechanism. So when an ETF issuer wants to create new shares for an ETF, he goes to an authorized participant, which is generally a large financial institution. This authorized participant then buys the underlying securities and delivers it to the ETF issuer who in return gives the authorized participant a block of ETF shares that can be then sold in the open market. This in-kind transaction in ETF parlance is called creation. Now, as you might have guessed, the same process works in the reverse at the time of redemption with the authorized participant now buying ETF shares to be returned to the issuer. ETFs in India are passively managed, although I should point out that globally, actively managed ETFs are growing at a fast pace and now constitute about 5% of the overall ETF AUM. Anyways, passive management is the chief distinguishing feature of ETFs, which then brings in a number of advantages for investors, which we shall discuss in greater details in later sections of this video. ETFs, index, mutual funds, and stocks represent three different asset classes for all practical purposes. Now, the most visible confusion here is between an ETF and an index fund. And one can understand why. After all, both constitute a portfolio of assets, they both track the index, and both of them are generally passive in its management. But there are differences. For instance, ETFs are listed on the stock exchange, which makes it tradable during market hours. The ETF prices fluctuate throughout the day, and one needs to have a DMAT account to trade in ETFs, which is not required for index funds. When we add stocks to this comparison, then this contrast becomes even more apparent. For instance, stocks are actively managed while ETFs are generally passive. Stocks don't have a tracking error or an expense ratio while ETFs have that. Stocks are concentrated bets while ETFs are a lot more diversified. And although ETF values are derived from the stocks, these are still governed by the demand and supply of these instruments amongst ETF investors. So pause this video, have a look at this table of differences that we have compiled here. And if you have any questions on that, please do write to us via the comments box below. Exchange traded funds come with a number of advantages, which is probably why this asset class has globally garnered a little over a trillion dollars in investment in 2021. 
So very quickly, ETFs are very simple, very transparent instruments. They are passively managed at most times. ETFs have low turnover, which keeps their expense structure extremely low. They can be easily bought and sold on the stock exchange. One can take advantage of intraday trading and volatility. The minimum investment is generally one unit and ETFs are a very handy instrument for diversification and risk management. Now on the flip side, exchange traded funds also come with some disadvantages. Firstly, and this is super obvious, that ETFs are passive instruments, which means they are not built to outperform the index that they are tracking. So if the Nifty 50 were to grow by 12% over a year, we can expect the Nifty 50 ETF to have delivered 12% or whereabouts during the same time period. A second disadvantage with ETFs is liquidity, which means if you need to sell your ETF units, then you can do that only if there are buyers for these units and at your asking price. Now, this is generally not a problem for broad-based ETFs like the Nifty 50 or government securities or gold ETFs, but this might be a problem for the more thinly traded ones. In fact, here's a quick list on the most traded and the least traded ETFs as on 6th of February, 2022. This will give you a fair idea on the liquidity of different ETFs. And if you want to know more, then do check out the complete list on nsindia.com. A third concern with ETFs is the tracking error, which measures the difference in the ETF's performance with the index that it tracks. Now, a tracking error is a function of multiple things. Delays in the purchase and sale of securities, expenses of the scheme, the ETF's cash holdings, delays in deployment of dividend, etc. These anomalies are always going to be there. And as a result, no ETF can mimic the index return in its entirety. But nevertheless, the tracking error is something that investors should keep an eye for. And as a general rule, lower the tracking error, the better it is. While the expense ratio of an ETF is generally low, there are certain other costs that are unique to it. For example, since ETFs are traded through a broker, it's possible that a brokerage or commission might be applicable on a buy or sell transaction. In addition to brokerage, there are other costs like exchange transaction charges, securities transaction tax, SEBI turnover fees, stamp duty, and of course the GST that the investor has to incur in the course of these transactions. And then there is the expense ratio, which is charged by the ETF issuer to cover the administrative costs of providing the investment instrument. So this works a lot like how expense ratios work in mutual funds, with the prominent exception that expense ratios in ETFs are much lower than their mutual fund counterparts. So to put it together, there are a number of these small, small expenses, which all add up as shown in this wonderful illustration we found in a recent newspaper article. Now, specific to expense ratios, what we have generally observed is that these are on the lower side for the more heavily traded ETFs like the Nifty 50, Gold, etc. But if one were to opt for the more thinly traded ETFs or even international ETFs, then it is prudent on the investor's part to keep an eye on expenses because these are generally a little more costlier and the more costlier these ETFs are, the more they will eat up your returns. By now, you would have realized that ETFs are not just an equity instrument. Today, ETFs are available for equity, for gold, for bonds. There are silver ETFs that have just come up, and we truly expect the ETF space to get super crowded a few short years from now. In fact, within the broader category of equities, ETFs can be designed and are available on multiple subcategories. For example, there are ETFs that cover the broader indices like Nifty 50, the Sensex, and the Nifty 500. There are ETFs for more specific sectors like banking or healthcare. Then there are thematic ETFs like the ESG ETF. And finally, we have strategy-based ETFs like the ones that track the Momentum 30 index or the low volatility index. Now, another ETF type that is fast growing in popularity are international ETFs. As the name suggests, these ETFs track indices like the NASDAQ 100, the NYSE FANG Plus Index, and the Hang Seng Index. Investing in these instruments can give your portfolio international diversification, 
which is becoming more essential and the subject of immense discussions nowadays. A constant inquiry amongst investors is what does the ETF do with the dividend money that is received from the shares that the ETF holds? Well, very simply, the dividend that is received by the ETF is reinvested back in the scheme in most cases. But having said this, there might be some exceptional cases where the dividends are credited back to the investors, but a majority of ETF issuers don't do that and per the objectives of the scheme, tend to reinvest the money back into the scheme. Now, on the part of the ETF issuer, it is important that this reinvestment of dividend happens as quickly as possible. Because the more this process gets delayed, the greater will be the chance of incurring a tracking error, which is something every ETF issuer wants to keep at the lowest level possible. There are no special tax rules for ETFs and the rules that are currently applied on mutual funds are the same ones that go with ETFs. So income from ETFs can arrive in two ways. Firstly, there is dividend income which may or may not come. And secondly, there is income from capital gains. With regards to the former, all income received via dividends is to be added to the investor's annual income and therefore this shall be taxed per the investor's applicable income tax slab. Particular to dividends, there is also some element of withholding taxes, so you might want to check up with your tax advisor for more specifics. When it comes to income on capital gains, there are two things to be considered. Firstly, the type of asset class the ETF qualifies for, and secondly, the holding period, which is the time period between the buying and selling of the ETF units. So in the case of equities, if you hold the ETF units for less than a year, then it's short term capital gain, which then attracts a tax of 15%. However, if units are held for one year or more, then long term capital gain rules apply, which means your gains are taxed at 10% in excess of an aggregate limit of 1 lakh rupees. When it comes to non-equity ETFs like debt or gold ETFs and also international ETFs, the holding period cutoff increases to three years. So if the holding is less than three years, then the investor will be taxed per his or her income tax slab. And if the holding exceeds three years, then tax is applied at 20% with indexation benefits. If this word indexation is new for you, then do watch our video on this very topic on the ET Money YouTube channel. And do consider subscribing to the channel and tapping on that bell icon for timely notifications. Exchange traded funds, a lot like shares, have a primary market and a secondary market. The primary market is the first time allocation of ETF units, which works a lot like any mutual fund NFO, which means you apply for units during the NFO period, you pay the money, and the units shall be allotted to you when the window opens. Once the initial allotment is done, the ETF is listed on the stock exchange, which is also called the secondary market, and further purchase or sales happen from there. Now, in order to operate ETFs, one needs to have two things. Firstly, one needs a trading account with a broker or sub-broker like Zerodha, ICICI Direct, Angel Broking, etc. And secondly, one needs to have a DMAT account with NSDL or CSDL for holding the ETF units. Additionally, each ETF has a specific symbol by which it is identified in these trading platforms. For example, if I want to purchase some units in the Mirai Asset NYSE FANG Plus ETF, then I'll search for the keyword FANG and my trading platform should pop out with the corresponding entry based on this identifier. I can then check the volumes and orders if I want to. And if I am satisfied, I can simply tap on the buy button to invest in that ETF. And that's it. It's as simple as buying a stock. Now, ET Money is presently not a trading platform for ETFs or stocks. But having said this, we have something better, which is our very own intelligent investing service called Genius. Genius is indeed genius in the way it uses ETFs and stocks to give you a personalized portfolio that is based on your risk tolerance. Genius is big on asset allocation, which it does dynamically in accordance with market condition. Genius also rebalances your portfolio at regular intervals. It invests in multiple assets like stocks, international equity ETFs, debt ETFs, and gold ETFs. 
one can choose from six different portfolio strategies and most importantly it is geared to deliver high returns consistent returns with excellent downside protection as a matter of fact we have a video on genius where we explain in greater details things like what is genius how was the service built and the genius portfolio strategies including how it has performed over many years so do watch that video and give et money genius a try and with this we come to the end of this video i sincerely hope this presentation has helped you organize your understanding of exchange traded funds and you'll employ this instrument more effectively in the future if you like what you saw then do tap on to that like button share this video subscribe to our channel and i look forward to catching up with you next week until then mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully